Hey everyone, this is just a sound check uh, before the webinar starts. If you can hear me, just type in the chat um, that you can, and we'll get started in a, a few moments here.
Okay, so welcome everyone to today's Unitronics webinar on Unistream and Unilogic. My name is Dan Logi. I manage the technical support department for Unitronics USA branch. I'm accompanied today by Thomas and James. If you have any questions, please enter them real time into the questions box. Thomas and James will be monitoring those questions and addressing them at the end of the presentation. So today we're going to be discussing Unistream, which is the hardware, and Unilogic, which is the programming environment for Unistream controllers. Now Unistream has three different families, right? Three different uh, lines, if you will. Uh, the first is the Unistream modular design. And here, we combine a HMI, a CPU, I.O. modules, and COM modules to make a single unit. You can see the screen size is listed there, a 7-inch, a 10.4-inch that's available in a multi-touch version, and a 15.6-inch HMI. These are the touch screens. The CPU snaps onto the back. You can see that in the picture to the left. And any I.O. and COM modules will snap on to the back of the panel as well. It can be expanded to a DIN rail if additional I.O. is needed. Okay, next is the built-in series. Here you can see the three different controller sizes, the HMI sizes, a 10.1 inch, a 7 inch, and a 5 inch. And these are built in, okay? So unlike the, the, the modular design, these controllers have onboard I.O. Okay, so I.O. is built into the back of the panel. And this can also be expanded to a DIN rail if additional I.O. is needed. Okay, these are great for uh, small cabinet sizes, right, where you don't have much depth in the cabinet, you can add one of these, you get all of your I.O. on board, all of your comms on board in a single unit. And the last piece of hardware that I want to introduce is the Unistream PLC, or the standalone PLC. Uh, you can see the picture to the right. It is uh, only a PLC, right? It comes in a version that has I.O., or you can get it with no I.O., and expand the uh, unit to the right. The HMI, or the screen, comes in the form of a uh, IoT device, like a cell phone, a tablet, a PC, or an HMI, right? The connection type is a VNC connection. So you program the screens inside of the controller and use, again, your smartphone or your tablet or your PC to access those screens. And we call this a virtual HMI. And this is a great option if the PLC needs to be inside of a cabinet or if you don't access the HMI very much, right? If an HMI isn't needed, uh, you can just use the PLC version of the Unistream and get all of the same functionality, right? It still has all the same um, I.O. capabilities, uh, ladder capabilities, and so on. So it's a great option uh, for those projects. Okay, so that was an introduction to the different Unistream controllers. Now let's take a look at Unilogic, the software environment. And this is how you program the controllers to perform tasks or to show things on the HMI. Now, there is one software to program Unistream controllers, right? It's an all-in-one software to program your PLC and ladder, your HMI, all of your IOs, all of your comms, and any motion you may have, right, like servos or VFDs. Now, let's take a look at the top of the software. This is what we call the ribbon, okay? And it has tasks that are not related to programming, such as downloading, uploading online mode, establishing communication to your device. 
You can import and export your, your tags or your, your memory of the controller and edit them in Excel. There's some debugging options and some commands here under Unistream Management, like setting the clock, resetting the PLC, updating the firmware, and more. There are additional tabs on the ribbon for help, which will be the help file, sample apps. And then the tools section will update um, with the project, right? So as you navigate your project, your ribbon will update and have additional options here at the top. So that's your ribbon. To the left is the Solution Explorer. This is how one navigates their project. You'll see everything from hardware configuration, where you define your controller and any I.O. models that you're working with. Any motion devices like servo or VFD will also be defined there. Communications, ladder and HMI, web server, the UniCloud, which is Unitronic Cloud Offering, all the way down to some more advanced functions like data tables, trending, emailing, SQL, and more. So again, this is how you navigate your project. If I'd like to go into the ladder, I expand the ladder, and I can navigate to a function. And here, I'll see my nets of ladder. I can also go to the HMI and navigate to an HMI screen. Right, and as I make a selection, the project updates. And I can go back and forth between these parts of the project. And that's how you navigate. At the bottom of the software is the tag database, starting with system, global, and more. Right? So system are system structs. Uh, these are pre-configured tags that have a predetermined function. So if I go into the general struct, I see there's an always off bit, an always on bit, a low battery bit, and if I take a look further, there's a touch bit, an X and a Y coordinate, where the user is touching the screen, and more. So all of these tags that have a predefined uh, function to them, right? That's your system tab. If I go to global, this is the memory of the project. These are all of the tags that are used in the project. Okay. For example, here we have a number of caps, a conveyor speed, whether or not the capping is taking place currently, and more, right? So all of the project tags are listed here. And if we needed the tag, we can add it within the software, or we can add it here under the tag database. And when I add a new tag, I give it a name. I'll call this uh, maybe button. Here I can define the type. Is it a bit, an integer, an unsigned integer, a real number, a string? Or is it something else? Right, there are many data types here. We can define arrays. If we needed more than one button, say we needed 10 buttons, we could define an array of buttons. We can choose whether or not the tag is retained on power cycle, which means it holds its value through a power cycle. And we can define a power-up value here. Should this tag power up in a one state, maybe, or a zero state? We can save, and the tag is added to the tag database, right? It is now ready to be used within the project. Timers have their own tab. I.O. also has its own tab for inputs and outputs. Structs are defining a new data type. Okay, so let's say that um, 
I have multiple pumps in my system, right? I can add a new struct and call it pumps or pump. And I'll save. And now I can add members to my struct. Uh, let's say that uh, first I want a name for my pump. Well, that's going to be a string, right? It's going to be ASCII characters. And let's say the maximum string length is 10. I can add. Next, let's say I want a set point for my pump. This will be a integer. Bit length 16. I'll go ahead and add my set point. Maybe a real-time pressure. Also integer 16. I can add it. Maybe an alarm bit. If the pump is in an alarm state. And finally, a on-off bit telling me if the pump is running. So here we've defined a new data type called pump, right? And it has these five uh, types within it, right? It's a group of mixed data, a name, set point, pressure, and two bits, one for alarm and a on-off. If I navigate here, the, the struct is created. Now, the real power with structs is that they are a, a type, okay? This is not yet a tag. What I can do is navigate back to global, and I can add a new tag. Let's say pump1. I can drop down the type, and instead of selecting a bit or an integer, I can scroll down to the bottom of the, saw of the uh, list here, and I can select my struct that I created called pump. I can add it, and pump1 is added to my tag database. I can also add pump2, and finally pump3. And I can continue to add pumps if I wished, um, and it would continue to add to this list, right? And notice that they are all type pump. So if I enter pump1, there are now five tags created for pump one, a name, set point, pressure, alarm, and a on off. Same thing with pump two. Right, I have the same five tags, only they are for pump two. So again, uh, the reusability here really slashes your development time, right? You can reuse these pumps on an as needed basis. You can create other structs, right, for, for elevators or for uh, boilers or so on right whatever you might reuse in your in your system okay so that's a little bit about structs a little bit about the tag database here next let's take a look at our ladder so here's our ladder I can zoom in I can zoom out I can have different functions for different parts or to to organize right and also to call as needed and I can build my ladder using the toolbox to the right the toolbox has all of my elements to build my ladder right and the toolbox is content sensitive so if I navigate to the HMI for example my toolbox updates to HMI elements, right, or screen elements. So again, taking a look at the ladder here, I can start building out net number one, putting in a direct contact by clicking, holding, and dragging. I can also double click. I can click, hold, and drag and put things in parallel, and the software helps me place the ladder elements. And I can put a coil at the end here. And again, basic elements are generally your contacts and coils. We have compare options, maybe uh, greater than in the front here. And when I click inside of 
the red empty, it asks me to link one of my user tags. I can also create a new tag using the pencil icon. Let's say I wanted to link uh, my pump one and say my set point is greater than my pump one pressure. Uh, maybe I have a set of conditions here to turn on the pump, right? And you can build your ladder as needed, right? There's no top or bottom, left or right to these. I can keep going to the right. And we can see the net just extends, right, to the right. And we can continue. There's a question, how do we do a one-shot? Uh, that would be a positive or negative transition contact here. Right, so if I wanted to recognize when the pump started, say pump one, I can link pump one on off, and this will tell me when the pump originally started. It'll pass power one time when the pump turns on. Say I wanted to recognize uh, when an alarm happened. Right, I could use a positive transition, link pump one, and the alarm bit. And again, this will pass power one time when the alarm happens. And we can take action on these, right, putting a ladder behind it to turn on outputs, or maybe alarms on the HMI, or physical alarms, right, like horns or lights, warning lights. You know, it's very flexible here. Okay, if I wanted to get rid of the ladder... I can just highlight and delete. Now let's go. Let's uh, go to the HMI here. And again, we see the toolbox has updated uh, with HMI elements, right? Everything from buttons to image elements, graphs and meters, media like video or PDF viewers. Schedule blocks, right, to show the time and the date, and more. And to use one, we can just click, hold, and drag the elements onto the screen. We can also double-click, and the elements will be added. It is a multi-layer display, right, so you can layer things on top of each other. And you can also delete the elements. To add a new screen, right-click on Module 1, Add New Screen. And Screen 1 is created, so we have a blank canvas here. We can change the background color and the properties for the screen. Right, maybe make it a blue. We can use the color palette here, maybe change it to a grayish, right? And then we can add our buttons to our new screen. Now again, once you have an element selected, the properties window will populate for that element. So right now button 3 is selected. In the properties windows is showing button three properties. This has everything from the name of the button to the background color, the border color, the style, and more. You can change the position here. One thing I do want to mention are actions, right? This is how a uh, element has a touch property. So I can add a action to this button. And these are things that will happen on a press. So I can add a new action. And the options are listed here. On a press, I can set a bit, reset a bit, toggle a bit. I can in increment or decrement a number. I can load a screen, load the last screen and more, right? So a lot of things I can do off a button press. Let's say I want to set a bit. Maybe I want to set my button bit that I previously created. 
I can do that on pressed. I can also maybe change it to a toggle so it'll turn on and off as I press. Maybe I want to know how many times the button has been, been pressed, right? So I can increment a number. Let's say this is my button count. Now I'll increment the number each time the button is pressed. And lastly, maybe I want to load a screen. I can select load screen from the drop down for actions, and I can choose the screen I'd like to navigate to when the button is pressed. So again, many button options, many uh, action options here for when you press a button. I can put a circular gauge on the HMI. And the properties window for the circular gauge appears, right? And notice that I can give the circular gauge action. Action is not limited to buttons, right? It can be uh, almost any HMI element can, can have an action, right? A lot of them support it. I could choose the layout of the circular gauge, maybe a half moon. I can choose the style. Right, many styles to choose from. Right. And I have to link a tag, right? Let's say I wanted to do the pump one pressure. Now my tag is linked to this element and the needle will move with the pressure. Okay. And you can see how easy it is to create the HMI screens here. It's very quick. There's snap to uh, element options, right? You can see the, the red lines appear. There's options up here for aligning, right? Maybe I want to align these three elements to the left, right? And I want to distribute vertically. So the alignment tools make it really easy to organize your HMI in a nice clean fashion. Okay, so there's a good question here. Um, as I navigate to parts of my project, right, you'll see the latest parts up here at the top, right? So I was in my, my ladder, my function one, my bottling screen, capping, gauges, and more, right? Let's say I wanted to view my function one, which is my ladder, and my bottling screen at the same time. No problem. I can click and hold bottling and move it and it detaches from the project. I can now put this on a secondary screen, right, and program at the same time my ladder and my HMI, right? It is a very nice feature to be able to view your HMI and your ladder simultaneously. I can also, if I'm only working with one screen, put them side by side, right? And I can see my ladder and my HMI next to each other, and I can customize my viewing space, right, by maybe minimizing some of these. I can even pin them or unpin them, right, to maximize my space. I can go ahead and repin them by hovering over them. And as I click on each one, the toolbox updates, right? So if I need uh, a ladder element, I can go ahead, take my ladder element, place it down. And if I need an HMI element, I'll click the HMI and drag a button. And I can program again si simultaneously, right? Very useful. So there is another question. Do we have any template options? Um, we do, right? So we have theming options here. So if you're on your HMI, uh, I'm going to just go through this again, right? If you're on your HMI, you can go to the tab up here to the top on your ribbon and open up your themes. And there's a default theme, right? But you can also add additional themes, right? Once you add a theme, you can add default colors um, and other things to the HMI elements. 
Uh, someone's asking if this session is recorded. It is recorded, so we'll be distributing that after the session. Okay. If I ever want to exit out of any of these, I just click the X at the top, right? And it will get rid of uh, my recently visited parts of the project and bring me back to just my ladder. Okay, I just want to touch on the hardware configuration real quick in the Solution Explorer, Hardware Config. We have the controller model selection, right? I'm using a 10-inch Unistream. We can add our I.O. here. So our I.O. modules by double-clicking each I.O. module that we have, and it's added to the back of the, the panel, the HMI. I can add a expansion adapter, and it will bring me down to a DIN rail, and I can add more I.O. modules. So this is essentially what you'd see uh, physically, right? Right now I have two models on the back and everything else on a DIN rail. I can put things in between, right? So if I maybe wanted to add a module in between these two, I go ahead and place it there. And everything updates, right? It's not like you need to remove everything and redo it, right? You can add modules dynamically. Okay, for each I.O. module that I add, at the bottom of the software, under the I.O. tab, is where your tags for your I.O. modules will reside, right? So this first I.O. module here is this model here. And if I go into the I.O., this model has eight inputs and eight outputs, right? And if I go into inputs, there are all eight bits for my digital inputs. I can add an alias name to this and call this maybe my uh, valve or something like that, right? And then when I use it in the ladder, I could take my direct contact, place it down, and I can reference the I.O. module directly, right? And they're located uh, here, right? I can reference my inputs directly. Or I can reference the alias name, right? So if I named it Valve, there is my alias name. And if I hover over it, it'll show you the input that the name is referencing. In this case, Module 1, Input 0. Okay. As long as the I.O. block is not in use in the project, you can right-click and delete it. And it will remove it from the project. Next, the Ethernet I.O. Here you can add your Ethernet adapter and add any Ethernet I.O. that you need, any modules that you need. And again, there's going to be uh, structs here under I.O. for those modules. And that's how you reference them in the project. If you have any motion, that's added under motion drives. And you can see servo drives are added here. Again, these are unitronic servo drives. You can add one to the project and define the motor that you're working with. And it's added, right? As simple as I.O. Everything is mapped and ready to be used in the ladder. We do have webinars strictly on servo, so you can reference those. Same applies for VFD. If I go to the VFD, I can add a VFD to the project. And the VFD is defined, ready to be used in the ladder, using the ladder tools to control the VFD. So that's a little bit about the hardware. Next, what I want to do is a quick example of a UDFB, or user-defined function block. So far, we've done everything in function one. And we're going to build a very basic function for our pumps. Uh, we're going to say if the set point is greater than the current pressure, right? So if our set point is higher than the pressure, we want to turn on the pump. I'm going to add a function 
and call it pump control. And inside the function, I'm going to define a function in. Okay, so at the bottom of the software, if I navigate to pump control, we can pass things in and out of this function, pass tags in and out. And what I'd like to do is create a tag called pump underscore UDFB. And the type is going to be my pump struct. And I'm going to save. So now the function is looking for a pump in. Now I can build out my ladder. First, a compare. I'm going to say greater than. And if the pump underscore UDFB uh, set point is greater than the pump underscore UDFB pressure, then I'm going to energize a coil the on off bit. Right? So basically I'm saying if the set point is greater than the pressure, turn on the pump. Now, if I go to my function 1, this pump control is a new function block, just like the function blocks in my toolbox. Right? It's going to be looking for input from the user. So if I click it, hold it, and drag it, I see that it shows up here in net number 1, and it's looking for an input. I can link my pump one struct to the input. And it's going to take in the pressure, the set point, the alarm bit, and the on-off bit for this pump. And I can reuse it, right, for pump one, pump two, and pump three. And this was a very basic example, right? But you can see the power here, right? You can build your own function block and reuse it as many times as you wish for repeat um, repeat control, right? Again, this could be a boiler or a conveyor or anything else that you can think of. Um, if you have repeat uh, control, the UDFB is a great function. Next, uh, piggybacking off of this example, I want to show a custom control. And that's going to be on the HMI. And it's essentially going to be a group of HMI elements that you can use on one of your pages. So I'll add a new custom control. And I'll call this uh, my pump. Pumps custom control. And just like the UDFB, I'm going to go into the writable parameters here, and I'm going to add a function in or a writable parameter to this custom control. And I'm going to call this my pump underscore custom control. And I'm going to drop down the type. Type is pump, right, that we created earlier. And I'm going to uh, save this. And now the writable parameter is a pump, right? Now, we can add elements to this custom control. So let's say we'd like uh, first to show the set point. Or maybe actually, yeah, let's show the set point with a number box, right? I'll put that in the top left. And for the properties, the tag that it's going to hold is going to be my pump underscore cc uh, set point and let's put a gauge right underneath it to show uh, the current pressure so I'll take a circular gauge circular gauge and I'll shrink it a little bit here I'll put that underneath and here in the tag I'm gonna link my pump underscore cc pressure right so now I'm showing my set point in the number box the pressure in a gauge format I'll dress this up a little bit just so it looks a little bit better I'll go ahead and change the style 
aggressive. Maybe I'll add a couple ranges here. Maybe 0 to 50 is green. 50 to 75, make yellow. And 75 to 100, we can make red. And you can see the colors are added to the gauge, right? And we have a lot more options here um, that I didn't touch on, right? Like changing the label color. Maybe we make that a nice uh, white. You can see the labels updated as, as such, right? Perfect. So now we have our custom control, right? Let's say that's good for now. I can go to the HMI tab here at the top. I can optimize the size. And we can see it shrinks the custom control down, right, to show just what's needed. Now let's go to the HMI and actually uh, put this on screen, because right now it is just a custom control. It's not used anywhere. I'm going to add a new screen just to demo this. And if I go to the toolbox, all the way to the bottom, there will be custom controls. And I can see my pump custom control is there. And I can put it on screen. And I can put as many as I wish on screen. Right? Again, uh, the reusable factor here. Right? It really cuts development time um, being able to reuse some of these elements. For each element, I can link its own pump. Right? And it's looking for the struct that I already linked. Uh, so pump one, pump two, and pump three. Right? All shown here. The nice part about the custom control is that if I do need to make a change, right? Let's say I wanted to add a button here. We can go back to the custom control. If we want to make it a little bit uh, bigger here, uh, we'll say the height is 250 now. Oop. Say the height here is maybe 300. Okay, now we have space for our button. I'll go ahead and put the button on the HMI, or on the custom control rather. Maybe that's a start-stop button. And if I go back to screen two, the button is added to each of the three custom controls, right? So again, as you add elements to these controls, everything updates. Okay, so that's custom control. The PLC does support hosting a web page, right? And right now we have a web server enabled. And here are some of the web pages. What I'm going to do is open up uh, Google Chrome quick. And I'll show you the web pages momentarily. Okay, and it's important to note that these web pages can be accessed uh, via a web browser, right? And here is a login page. And you can see it's got logins, time, date. I could log in and navigate my HMI pages. I can make changes just like I was in front of the HMI, right? Right on the web page, and it will accept the tags. Now, it's important to note that the web pages don't need any uh, HTML coding required, right? You'll see up here in the toolbox, it's a lot of the same elements that were available on the HMI, right? And you can build out your web page with these elements, right? Just like you would your HMI. So it's much more streamlined, much more simple um, than coding in HTML, right? No, uh, no knowledge required there. Uh, there's a nice functionality to convert HMI pages to web pages, right? So say this bottling page, I would like on the web page, I can right-click, export to web server, and it'll take the page 
and convert it to a web page. If I scroll down, I now have my bottling web page. And here it is, right? It might need a little bit of, um, of redesign as far as the elements go. There's a little bit of blank space to the right, but everything converts, right? It's very clean um, to be able to convert your HMI pages to web pages. Okay, that's the web server. Next thing I'd like to touch on is languages. So here in the Solution Explorer, I can go to languages. Uh, the default, my default is currently English. That can be changed in the options menu. Uh, but let's say I'd like to add another language, right? Let's say I'd like to add uh, French. I can click OK. And now I'll have an option for French. I can click it. And you'll see here that every element in my project that has text on it is in this language um, section here, right? I have my English language and then a column for French to convert the language, right? And I can enter the French version of button one here, right? If you'd prefer working in Excel or you might send this out to a translator, right? You can go to the languages tab in the ribbon. You can export this language to Excel and you can make all your conversions in the uh, Excel column for French. Right. Once you're done, save the uh, the Excel file and then import it back to the project. So language conversion is very easy here, uh, and you can add many languages to the project. You're not limited to just two. We could add another. Uh, maybe we want to add uh, Spanish and Turkish and Russian. We can add all of them, right? And they're all here, and you can create. Uh, an Excel file for each one, right? Just exporting and importing the Excel file. Okay. Next option I'd like to discuss uh, quickly are communications. So if I go to the PLC communication tab here, we have first the physical connections, right? These are the IP addressing, the serial port settings, the CAN bus port settings, right? And then we have the protocols tab, okay? And this is where you set up different protocols uh, for the controller to communicate. So BACnet IP is supported, OPC UA, SNMP, Modbus, MQTT, FTP, Ethernet IP, can open, and, and more, right? So what I'm going to do quickly is maybe show an Ethernet IP scanner, right? Um, we support EDS import, which is electronic data sheet, right? So I can click on the import node from EDS. And I'll import uh, a third-party Ethernet IP EDS file, right? This is a um, Cognex camera, right? I'll go ahead and import it. And it is now created, right? I can add the IP address of the device here. And at the bottom of the software, under I.O., the tags for this device were added. We can see here under inputs, it's an array of 502 uh, bytes. And then under the outputs, I believe it's the same thing here. Yes, so same thing. But the communications are automatically established, right? From that EDS, the tags are created. It has the right sizes and the right pointers. So very easy to implement an EDS or in a, uh, an Ethernet IP scanner, right? And again, you'll have to add the IP address of the node. Maybe this is for me, 10.2.2.102 or 101, something like that. And your connection or your setup is now complete.
can open, same thing, right? You can add can open nodes from EDS files. MQTT is a uh, generally a I, it's it's an IIoT protocol, right? But it is uh, for it's a low overhead protocol for communication to cloud platforms, databases, and more, right? So essentially, there will be a broker that collects all of the data, and we can publish topics to the broker, and we can also subscribe to topics from the broker. And again, a broker can be a cloud service, it could be a database, it could be a, a piece of hardware, right? Like a, a controller type device. A very popular protocol. Uh, it's, it's growing in popularity and it's very easy to use. FTP, file transfer protocol, is to send and receive files. For example, if you have a report generated, at the end of the day, and you'd like to send that to a server, FTP is a great option. Uh, similarly, if you wanted to uh, have updated recipes on your controller, we could receive updated recipes uh, from a uh, FTP client or server, right? So it's a way of sharing files. Uh, OPC is generally for uh, SCADA platforms, right, or uh, data collection platforms. Um, very popular in that world. FactNet is very popular in the building management industry, right? So if you're in a building, uh, a FactNet Explorer will collect data and show that data uh, on their side. And again, it's collected via FactNet. Okay, um, the last communication option I wanted to mention, or actually a few more here, SQL, right? If you wanted to communicate to an SQL database, uh, we can send queries to that database. REST APIs are supported. If there's an API server uh, and you'd like to send or receive data that way, you can do it. Uh, data tables and data sampling are supported, so tables for logging, recipes, or maybe a login option there. Uh, data sampling is trending. And real quick, I'm just going to show an HMI of a 10.4 inch that I have on my desk. It has a demo project loaded into it. I can show the, the trending here. Here's an example of the trend. I can stop the trend and inspect the points on the HMI. I can go ahead and play or resume the trend. Uh, this connection here is a VNC connection, and the reason I'm showing it quick, it's what the Unistream PLC will use to access the HMI pages, right? So, again, the no screen unit uses a VNC connection. Uh, this is tight VNC that I'm using now to access the pages of the HMI remotely. And again, this can be done on a smartphone, a tablet, PC or an HMI that supports BNC. Okay, VNC connection, somebody asked about it. It's a virtual network connection, right? It's popular in the industry. It's not specific to Unitronics. Um, we support server and client, right? So if the Unistream is a server, other VNC clients can access the pages. So right now, my controller is set up as a server. My PC is acting as the client to view the HMI. If I'd like to use a Unistream to view a different HMI, maybe duplicate a screen, Unistream to Unistream, one Unistream would be set up as the server, the other would be set up to the client, and you can duplicate that HMI. It's important to note that as I make selections here on my PC, 
the actual HMI updates, right? So this is the HMI being duplicated on my PC currently. Can we use VNC remotely? Yes, for sure you can, right? Uh, you can do it over a network, right? You can do it over a cellular connection, a Wi-Fi connection. Um, you will need to have some network hardware there, right? So the Unistream will have to be on a network and the traffic will need to be allowed in the form of a VPN or port forwarding, right? But if you have a discussion with your IT team or whoever set up your, your network, I'm sure that they can assist with this. You can also call our support team and we're happy to help as well. Uh, apps that we would recommend uh, for the PC, we'd recommend Tight VNC as a test. It's a, it's a free download. For the smartphone or tablet, uh, VNC Viewer is a great option. Real VNC is a great option. There are also some very feature-rich options out there that are that are paid services, right? But everything that I've mentioned to this point is just a free download on the App Store or on the web. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and pause and read the questions. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the questions box now. Thanks, Dan, for that. And as, as you said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We'll give it a few moments here for some questions to come in, and then that will conclude today's webinar. There's a question here about licenses and activation. Um, you have 30 days to use Unilogic before you need to register it. At that point, uh, you will not be able to download to a PLC. To activate or to register your software, uh, there's a menu in the, the tools menu of Unilogic where you can enter in your, your company's information. And then it should send you an email with a license key. Once you get that, you can enter that license key into the software and you'll be good to go. If you don't get the email, you can check your spam folder, but otherwise contact our support team and we can help you locate or uh, help, help to activate your software.
There's another question here about VNC. Um, with Unistream, you have two VNC options. You can either have it not password protected or open, or you could have it password protected. If you do password protected, you can have two different passwords, one for full access, so for uh, for viewing and for interacting. You'd also have a view only password, and this is set up under your Unilogic you know, VNC server management. So we have our VNC server working mode here. Right now it's enabled with no password, but we can enable it and set a full access and a view only password. Uh, we have another question here about communication to servos. Um, our servos communicate over CAN bus and Ethercat. Um, but if you have another servo that uses a different protocol, such as Modbus, Ethernet IP, uh, so on and so forth, uh, we can certainly support that with Unistream. The Unistream series is, is our only series that supports Ethernet IP protocol, uh, whereas Vision series would only support things like Modbus and custom protocol. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions for today. So thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact our support team. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you got. Uh, thanks for joining us today and have a, have a wonderful day. Goodbye.